In this video today, we're going to play with action figures because we don't like dolls. <laughs> nah, 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 nah. You it's need funny. to step up your class, sir. I don't know. I don't know if you... Was that a lowbrow joke? I'm embarrassed. I'm going to go over here and eat my jam sandwich. <laughs> and welcome to the Codex Cantina, where I am Una. And I am underappreciated crypto. If you are new to the Codex Cantina, we go deep into the literature that we read, bringing out some of the hidden meanings and interpretations. If you are down for literature discussions like that, please hit that subscribe button. And as always, we start off with publication information. Today, we are looking at the classic The Doll's House by Catherine Mansfield, published in 1922. This is a very amazing piece by an outstanding author. She is a New Zealander, and she uh, had a pretty tragic life where she got sick, uh, diagnosed at 29 and died at the young, young age of 34. This text covers several themes such as class inequality and using money and status as a weapon. Ooh, money and weapons, two of my favorite things. Tell me more, good sir. All right, so first what we're going to do is do a quick plot recap to make sure we're all on the same page for the major plot points, and then we're going to go into some of the discussion, breaking it down even further together. So for plot, Mrs. Hay sent the Burnell children a small, exquisite dollhouse. They placed that dollhouse up for display in their backyard. Isabel Burnell, the oldest daughter of three, wanted to be the first to tell all the other school children about it. The schoolmates were asked by twos to see the house each day after school. That is, all except the Kelvies, who were continually shunned and ignored by the more upper-class members. One day, after everyone had seen the dollhouse, Kezia secretly invites the Kelvies over to see it. As they are shown the house, Aunt Beryl comes out and shoos them away. End the plot. Wah, wah. Okay, so in terms of analysis and how I think we should start this discussion, let's just jump straight into the themes and subjects of class because that's kind of the main, I feel like, thrust of this story. First of all, did you ever have any problems kind of keeping the children straight? Yeah, there are a lot, and the the Kelvies don't really have any speaking lines to the end, so it is a little bit tough. So one of the things that I learned is if you think about the Burnells, we have Isabel, who is the oldest, and then Lottie and Kezi. And then we have Kel the Kelvies with Lil and Else. And one thing that I learned to kind of keep at least two of them straight is Lottie because she's got a lot of stuff, because she's high class, right? <laughs> yeah. And, L and Lil, she's got a little amount of stuff, because she's lower class. <laughs> There's my one little trick. <laughs> she's got little else. <laughs> but you know, whether that was done on purpose or not, I don't know. But there is some interesting usage by Mansfield in this, where you'll notice that she continually compared the Kelvies to stray cats and chickens, and just constantly depicted a stray or lost or less expensive lifestyle for these characters, right? Yeah, I, I noticed that uh, the, the dingy clothes uh, definitely paint them as lesser than. Their food, it paints them as lesser than. There's a lot of little clues that uh, sprinkled throughout the story that obviously depicts these two girls as being impoverished. All right, so let's jump into this. What is the dollhouse? They had never seen anything like it in their lives. All their rooms were papered. And you have to remember that back in the day, wallpaper was cool, but wallpaper was also a sign of decadence. It was more expensive, aka another sign of wealth, and their dollhouse had it, right? Yeah, exactly. This story is, I think, the quintessential best telling ever of social divide, that the dollhouse represents all of society, and then it's broken into all these little pieces of different classes. Okay, I think um, let's let's get into that a little bit more because this is obviously an expensive dollhouse. So when you say all society, you're going to have to sell me on the dingy parts of it because one of the ways that I took this piece was that this was representing of high society specifically. This is decadence. This is upper class. This is aristocracy. And all of the little girls don't play with it, right? They come over and they look at it. <laughs> And that's all they do. They're, they're allowed to come over and just look at this dollhouse, but they can't play with it. Because all the girls are getting a look, I felt like, into high society when they are looking at this dollhouse. That's a great point. But I will ask you this one question, sir. Mm. Where are they looking at the dollhouse? In their backyard. Yes. Would you just put something so valuable 
just thrown in your backyard? Well, there was that quote, though. They said, it was summer. Nothing would happen to the dollhouse. I thought that was kind of interesting. Like, what was... I wonder, is that a New Zealand thing of some sort? Like, summer, nothing happens? Like, do they not have storms? You have to remember that in New Zealand, it's going to be reverse for us here in the United States to where wintertime mm. is going to be the summer months for us. But for there, it's going to be November, December, January. I don't know the weather patterns all perfect there or anything, but I think that even if it was something lavish, rich people would still put it inside It would be in a glass case. If it's that ornate and that special, it would not be just put in the backyard. I I, Mm. I don't believe it would be. What did you take away from the fact that they had like some dolls that came with it, but the girls didn't want to play with them? I think this is the girls trying to kind of find their own way. I think the dolls maybe feel too reminiscent of themselves and they don't want to play with them for that fact. So I think in my interpretation, so in the interpretation that this is specifically high society, the dollhouse, I'm viewing this as a materialistic move. They don't want to play with other people. They want the materials. They want the wealth. They want the show. And when the little girls come over in groups of two, decided by who? right? By the parents saying you can bring two girls over at a time, decided by which two girls. Well, that was Isabel, right? There's a hierarchy even within these three Burnell children. Isabel is the oldest, so she makes the decisions. There's a hierarchy within the children in the same sense that there's a hierarchy within society of the classes that all of these lead through decisions that allow who of the little girls can't pl- not to come over to play with the house, but to come over and look at the house, to to peer into a lifestyle that they don't have is kind of one way that I would take the interpretation. Yeah, it's a good little subtle nuance that's kind of embedded in there as well. I like it. Well, it's interesting too, because you'll notice that both the, the parents say, yeah, you can't bring the Kelvies over to look at this. You can't play with the Kelvies, right? And Isabel makes the decisions of which of her friends get to play. You have the quote, the girls of her class nearly fought to put their arms round her, to walk away with her, to beam flatteringly, to be her special friend. This is privilege as a weapon. This is the definition of using your power, money, etc., to further strengthen your position and have other people vie for being that, that person to support you. Exactly. And I I think that also that Mansfield is trying to make the point here that this is a taught behavior because a lot of times the girls ask, why can't, you know, the Kelvies come over and they say, no, 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 they can't come over. It's because the children are innocent and they don't get it. But they're being taught these behaviors that some people are lesser than you because of what they don't have or what they do have, et cetera. Okay. Now their school's the melting pot, right? That's where we get the Kelvies. How do you... How do you do you take this as upper class versus lower class or how do you interpret the purpose of the Kelvies in the story? Yeah, I think the Kelvies are definitely representing the lower class. I think they're representing what these people are controlling over others and that money is what is going to give you that power over other people. And the melding pot has been a terminology that's been used for decades as not only I think a societal a class issue, but also a racial divide issue as well. And that's something that's not brought up at all. And that's very interesting that because I think she's a New Zealander, maybe that isn't as big a factor, but it is here in our country. Now, one thing that I thought that was kind of interesting about the Kelvies, like you said earlier, they had the secondhand clothing, they're drinking jam and newspaper wrapped lunches as opposed to the mutton, leftover meat, right? Is she kind of gives us a, a point of view from the Kelvies too? It gave it more than just upper class versus lower class because we, we got almost kind of like some perspective from the lower class in this story, I would say. And I like this quote. It said, the Kelvies never failed to understand each other. And if you'll notice in the story, the girls are constantly gossiping, the upper classmen. Like they, they're saying stuff without actually communicating or really doing anything de- different. They're just talking to each other. But the Kelvies, without really having to talk, understand each other. And I think that's one thing that the upperclassmen never did is understood the Kelvies. They've never talked to them. They don't interact with them. But that, but the Kelvies show that you don't necessarily even have to talk to someone directly to understand or even empathize with them. Oh, and I think the Kelvie girls are not 
verbally gossiping, but they're definitely involved in this, even though they don't have that speaking roles. And that comes out evident to the last line of the story when she finally makes her quote. I seen the little lamp, she said softly. Then they both were silent once more. I think that that really, it, and then they're silent again. I think that kind of pushes forward this idea that she has seen into this other world. And that's her first kind of little piece of gossip. Like, I've seen it. And I've got a glimpse and I know now as she, you know, and then they go back silent again. Why do you think it was the lamp that they focused on as well as Kezia, who is the one that kind of tried to cross that upper class to lower class divide? I think there's a lot of people that believe that this is kind of the ideal of hope. But I look at the lamp more as a guiding light of maybe what we want to be. It's in the center of the the dollhouse. And I think it's something that tries to encapsulate all the goodness for us, as we know that light kind of represents sometimes positivity. I think that's more than just hope. I think that it is something that we all strive for. I think it's interesting, too, how both the upper class men, Kezia, who, who, who's our bridge, right, sees this lamp. It, was it a single alone lamp? Like, wasn't it kind of described as almost singular? I think there's even a part where, like, Isabel and Lottie go off and do something and leave Kezia behind. Kezia's kind of isolated. The Kelvies have each other. They're not isolated either. The only character that is kind of isolated, in a sense, is Kezia. And it's interesting that they see the light through Kezia. Kezia being whether she's hope or whether she's the striving to be a better person. I think that's very symbolic to, to your point that the Kelvies, what they focused on was the lamp, which is what Kezia focused on. So she's kind of being that guiding light to be a better person in this story. It, it's kind of interesting, the symbology there. Yeah. And Kezia is the one that eventually invites them to see the dollhouse too. Right. That's what I'm saying. She was the bridge between upper class and lower class trying to kind of yeah. ignore those barriers. Uh, a last little piece that I had here is, did you notice anything about gender in this at all? No, I didn't pick up much of that. I mean, it's, it's all girls, so I don't know if, if uh, Mansfield's writing that just because she is a female, but they don't have any males, which is very unique. Well, like you said, it could be because she's a female, but I'm actually going a different direction. So when they were describing the Kelvies, Lil Kelvy was described as, what a little guy she looked. It was impossible not to laugh for this little girl to look like a little guy. And then Elsie Kelvy says, Elsie wore a long white dress, rather like a nightgown, and a pair of little boys' boots. So both of these girls are having two masculine, two, two boy terms being thrown at them, and they're the outsiders amongst this group of girls. I don't know enough about Mansfield to come to a strong conclusion there, but there was clearly a a conscious effort, I feel like, to masculinize these two outsiders. I could see that because I think a lot of times when girls are portrayed as being poor, they give them the boy clothes that might be hand-me-downs or they give them that mm -hmm. rougher tomboy look to, yeah. you know, dirtify them. And I right. think that that's what she's doing here to make them seem even more. Okay. Yeah, I can definitely see that trope there. I just wondered if there's more to that. And if we read more of Catherine Mansfield, do we have do we have more of a conversation here from a feminism standpoint with, with why she made that decision? Something we won't know until we read more Mansfield, I guess. Exactly, exactly. All right, Crypto, what's your ratings? Uh, I thought this one was amazing. Again, I think this, this is the pinnacle of showing class divide with the little house and the girls, and it's so subtly woven in there. Uh, all around, I'm going to give this an awesome 8.5. Bam. I enjoyed this story. I, li I liked reading it. It was good. Shazam. All right. I think I am going to go with just one rating as well. I'm going to go with a more solid seven from my perspective. Definitely a very interesting story and definitely very instructive to have a class discussion on. Yeah, and I think there's a lot of things that we didn't talk about here with like class divides of how we have divided ourselves and then how we have this like mob mentality and we can see a little bit of that in the story as well. And there are I think a few other things that we could have, you know, gone into more detail about if we knew her a little bit better and maybe if we knew the history of the her country a little better, I think we could get even more out of this story. Perhaps another day in another Mansfield story will bring us back to those discussions. Until then, we appreciate you guys and hanging out with us and having a conversation about great literature. If you're down for more discussions like that, please consider hitting the subscribe button. Una out. Peace.